Ugh. Oh my. That's just not right. Disgusting. Just look at all that aliasing. <laughs> Hi, this is Alex from Digital Foundry. Anti-aliasing is a term that most have a direct connection with just on mention. It is a thing that gets rid of jaggies, right? These days though, it can mean a whole lot of things as graphic engines become more complex and the methods for getting rid of those jaggies multiply and diversify. So today's video is going to investigate the term anti-aliasing with a focus of what it is on a technical level and getting some general information out there so that you, the viewer, can have a better idea perhaps when clicking through those AA options in a game menu. A good starting point here, I think, is the phrase, know thine enemy. Anti-aliasing is a term defined through its platonic opposite in aliasing. So the breadth and types of aliasing necessitate the breadth and types of measures to combat it. But without opening up a dictionary, I think it's best to just think of aliasing as a rapid, steep, or stark change in visual information. These rapid, steep, and stark artifacts in an image disrupt your mind's continuous unconscious flow from one pixel to the next, or one from grouping of pixels to the next grouping, or from one frame to another. And when you think of it like that, a whole host of aliasing types can now be thought up. You have your first typical one that I think most people can imagine and most people are used to, outer edge aliasing. Typically found on the edges of polygonal geometry, or non-vector graphics, this is mainly caused by the resolution of shading being the same as the resolution of output. So here you can imagine a grid as being the final rendered image, and all those squares in that grid being the shaded pixels. If you just shade those grid squares based upon the middle point here, you are returning a proper value, but in the context of the grid squares next to it, and conveying cohesive information to a brain, it starts to look a bit blocky. This is typical, and generally what an unadulterated rasterized image looks like in a game without any anti-aliasing. So the way developers solved this originally was by increasing the density of that grid, which changes that same point. So now instead of one center point determining that shading or that pixel, you have four sub or super points affecting its color now. So now instead of being a stark transition from one pixel to the next, the edge would be gradiated, and in between color value. It just looks smoother. This here is called ordered grid supersampling, and I think right away a problem with it becomes immediately apparent. To get that nicer gradient, you have to essentially render the image at four times the internal resolution, and you're doing that for every pixel, even though a number of them really do not need to look so continuous with their neighbor, or they already do maybe, and that's really expensive. This grid example here I showed is also an ideal scenario, where the sub-sampled points, those four, are in a perfect position to shade that pixel, making it seem continuous to its adjacent neighbor. But not all games are made up of objects and lines which perfectly align with that ordered grid. Long near vertical, or long near horizontal lines or edges which misalign with this grid pattern, will still showcase those gaps of information and look less continuous, especially in motion. So there are two things that can be done. You can change those samples to not be aligned with that grid, thus making sparse grid super sampling, or you can selectively treat certain edges, which knowingly cause aliasing in comparison to those that often do not. In this case, there is multi-sample anti-aliasing, or MSAA, which only treats the edges of polygonal geometry. This was historically the area most aliasing would come from, and it is decidedly cheaper in comparison to the same image which uses four times supersampled anti-aliasing in comparison to one that uses four times multi-sample anti-aliasing. But here we are just looking at one facet, the spatial information of a rendered frame out of motion. But as soon as you put that visual into motion, many parts of that seemingly smooth screen can now be changing rapidly and producing aliasing in their own right. Take for example textures on this roof here in The Witcher 3. In this case, when it is sitting still, it looks fine and really detailed. But in motion, that area of the screen looks like it fizzles and crackles. Here the outer edge of the geometry is not the problem, but its inner surface is, so multi-sample anti-aliasing wouldn't really help, and you would require lots of super sampling to fix this problem. 
The texture detail here is simply too high, and it is unaligned with that grid of pixels that the game is outputting, causing a rapid change in shading from one frame to the next as the camera moves. This can be alleviated by increasing density of the grid and pixels for super sampling, but as said, it's also expensive. So a clever way to help here is to instead just lower the resolution of the texture there, based upon how far away it is from the game camera, so it better aligns. This is called a mipmap. The idea of a mipmap points to an interesting case in aliasing and anti-aliasing. It need not be just thought about how to treat the pixels in the end, in that screen space grid I keep mentioning. You can instead alter the asset, which is causing aliasing at the source, to help alleviate the problem. So for example, in a game, you can reduce the complexity of geometric detail at a distance for an object so that it is more stable from one frame to the next. Geometric level of detail models, or LODs, in the distance not only make games run better so they're shading less complex geometry, but it can also clear up aliasing. Reducing the geometric complexity of an object is not the only way to reduce aliasing in the distance. This brings me to another topic which is extremely relevant for modern games. Back when SSAA or MSAA or even mipmaps were thought out, games were still really diffuse and visual detailed. Those colored, diffuse textures drove the look of how a surface appeared. But with the advent of normal maps, bump maps, etc., you can now have shiny surfaces, or specularity. Metals looking shiny, leaves looking shiny. So while super sampling anti-aliasing can help here, multi-sampling will do nothing here as it only treats geometric edges. So now you have engines also who have switched over to physically based rendering of materials. And every object out there in a the scene now in a modern engine that is physically based can be specular depending upon the angle you look at it due to the Fresnel effect. So the less perpendicular your view is to an object surface, such as water for example, makes it less transparent and more reflective, as more light is bounced scattered along the view direction, thus making it shinier. And everything has for now, so there's going to be so much more shiny objects causing aliasing in a scene now. And even if we wanted to use MSAA to just help geometric edges here, a lot of these engines these days are deferred in shading, meaning the use of standard MSAA is more complex or more expensive than it would otherwise be. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, it's not only the edge surface or inner surface of an object which produces aliasing, but the apparent motion of an entire surface or object from one frame to the next can also cause visual strobing, or look visually discontiguous another form of aliasing. Especially on modern LCD displays where ghosting from the previous frame can be still seen in the current. For example, you could have a ball rapidly moving across the screen at 30 frames per second. If it is moving with a high enough velocity, it could be on the screen for maybe two frames? From the viewer's perspective, it would look like a ball flickered into existence at one location and then flickered into existence again at another after disappearing, being visually distracting and not at all conveying the motion that it should. This temporal aliasing is not limited to 30 FPS or extremely fast moving objects, as any object that moves will produce visual gaps between this frame and the next, if the frame rate is not high enough to make even apparent movement equivalent to one pixel's movement. So with 30 FPS, 60, or even higher, you still have problems with temporal aliasing. You would need thousands of frames per second, and a display which could show them, to prevent this effect from happening. So as you can see, the term aliasing and the measure to prevent it in anti-aliasing in fact cover a breadth of phenomena which developers pay attention to and constantly have to balance in the development of their engines, art assets, and performance profiles, as if game development wasn't stressful enough. But the aforementioned problems are not insurmountable, and developers are working on clever ways to combat them in spite of their complexity. Although MSAA is less readily available these days due to the cost and complexity of getting it working, there's been a rise in post-process anti-aliasing such as FXAA or SMAA. These intelligently seek out edges and smoothen the image after it has already been produced. This of course has its problems. Firstly, a frame changes from one to the next, so the blended results from the post-process AA from one frame will be different than those from the next making the image still rather unstable. Also, since the maths are just guessing primarily in an intelligent way, maybe based upon a stencil or some other method, there's a good chance that the image could be overly softened, while still leaving some edges being untreated. So the answer to this then is to give that post-process more information. Taking a cue from the super expensive super sampling, developers have introduced various forms of post-process anti-aliasing 
which rely on the information from previous frames to inform the shading of pixels in the current frame. By jittering the current frame on a sub-pixel level, and a bit off-center from the previous, temporal anti-aliasing can provide better than SMAA, FXAA edge blending with similar minimal cost, and it'll be stable from frame to frame, either by accumulating multiple previous frames together, or by using the most recent last frame as a point of reference, Temporal AA can achieve the quality of super sampled images in a fraction of the cost, and depending upon inflammation, with better gradients even on long edges. But this technique of course has its downsides. So while it does generally offer wonderful images in stills, that image itself may be rather softened in comparison to an image which was spatially super sampled, sure temporal anti-aliasing may use subsamples along that grid that we talked about earlier like traditional super sampling, but those samples are instead spread over time, so their averaged shading may end up being too averaged, so to speak, softening the pixels too much. To combat this, developers have now started to change the method of filtering those combined results to be sharper and not just be a linear combination of the past, or instead they can use a post-process sharpening filter after the fact to restore some of that detail. Beyond this, temporal AA can also have problems with ghosting, as information from previous frames is not fully projected or rejected in the current frame, leaving trails behind objects, or offering a stark ghosting or flickering on objects that cannot be easily tracked from this frame to the last, like transparencies. So while temporal AA and post-process AAs can help many forms of aliasing, specular aliasing is still a problem in most engines, and to combat it specifically, developers have invented methods of getting to the problem by attacking it at the source again, kind of like MIP maps, in the texture itself which is responsible for that aliasing. Choosing from a variety of methods, developers can choose to smoothen the specularity of a normal map in the asset itself now, thus reducing its chance to produce single frame sparkles or fireflies which bloom out. Techniques to smoothen this texture though do end up changing the material, so it is no longer completely representative of that material that is supposed to represent from the real world. And regarding that temporal aliasing I mentioned earlier, you know with that annoying example with the flickering ball, as much as some viewers may find it implausible, developers use properly implemented Project Motion Blur, which acts as temporal anti-aliasing. Proper Project Blur smooths over the visible gaps between frames, and gives a sense of direction and motion to objects which are only shortly visible on screen. As a way to remedy that problem, since we do not have the ability to render and display most games at thousands of frames per second. So aliasing is seemingly eternal, but the fight against it is as well. But what are some basic points about it that you can use when in a game menu? Well I think it is best to make a hierarchy of costs and needs. SSAA is the most expensive, but has the best quality. MSAA only works on some edges, is rather expensive, and barely exists in most games anymore. Temporal anti-aliasing is much cheaper than the last two, and provides comparable quality to them, but has blurring and ghosting downsides. Post-AA like FXAA and SMAA are very, very cheap, and of okay quality, and they are best if combined with one of the other methods. And with that little bit of advice, this video now comes to an end. I would like to thank you for taking the time to watch it, and hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did like what you saw, and heard, hit that like button, and subscribe to the channel. If you would like to discuss anti-aliasing with me in any capacity, write a comment below, or follow myself and Digital Foundry on Twitter. This is Alex, bidding you farewell, und auf Wiedersehen.